Hello and welcome to Gearock Farms. Today we got a Q&A video for you guys. So uh, the reason we're doing it, it's the middle of winter right now here on the farm and uh, it's a pretty cold day so we thought what better than to uh, answer some of the questions that you guys may have for us. And uh, we did a Q&A about six months ago last summer and we thought we'd revisit it because we've grown a lot and we've had a lot of new viewers come to the channel and we got a lot of comments and a lot of questions so we thought what better than to touch on those questions and, and get some answers for you guys. To start off the video, this is Gear Rock Farms. I'm Aaron and this is my dad, George. And um, we're going we're gonna to try to answer you guys' questions so let's, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, one of the first comments that I seen was with uh, hobbyists and um, smaller farms starting up, you know, just those 5 to 30 acre farms. It seems like they're buying up a lot of small equipment, at least according to this viewer. And they were wondering, has it gotten harder for us to find that older equipment that we like to use? And I, I think to answer right away, yes, because it's just, it's getting older. There's less of it, they aren't making it. It's hard to find parts, but you can still, you can still find parts. You can still maintain your- The machines that, that are older are wore out. Yeah, and then it goes for scrap iron and some of that stuff. So, but even uh, like restoring some of these older machines and stuff. It's always the same part that everyone's looking for. But we don't really, I mean, like, like the really old tractors, they don't get used as hard as they used to. So we're not like... We're not wearing them out. We're not wearing out those parts as often. <laughs> we're, or if something ain't quite so-so, we got some newer stuff that we can still get by with. So. And when it comes to your typical, uh, you know, serviceable parts like brakes, Filters. I don't think we've had any trouble. No, that it's stuff. actually. I think it's gotten better, and I think the hobbyists kind of encourage the fact, and you know, that there's aftermarket companies building yeah, certain getting, parts, getting into that that yeah. uh, that niche market. So, if anything, the hobbyist side of things might have improved that a little or kept it alive. Yeah. Um, but they they for sure make you pay for some of the parts. But the tractors are old, fifty to eighty years old. I mean, it's kind of expected to be. All right, jump into the next question. Um, have we ever run out of grain storage here on the farm? And if so, what have we done to handle that? I mean, for one thing, so dry grain, uh, about 4,000 bushels. I mean, and we don't, we don't, it doesn't vary much from year to year on the acreage of, of corn we'd have for grain. So sometimes maybe uh, I might have to find room for 500 bushel. And uh, we have a granary where we get it, somebody to shell it or we, borrowed those gravity boxes that one year and then filled those up and topped them off with our elevator in the shed there. So just, just uh, maybe grind a few extra batches, which is a great thing. We never sell grain. I've never, yeah. we've always bought a little years ago. I used to have to buy some when we had less land. What he's saying is it, it gets fed out fast enough to where even where we have a temporary storage system like a gravity wagon, it's still, it's still okay for us because our permanent storage, then we can just, we can save that for later. Yeah, that, that's always more secure. So no, we haven't had to, uh, you know, send it to a grain bin or anything like that off the farm anyways. This we'll just touch on briefly. Hopefully we'll be able to do a history video in the, the future. There's a lot of people asking for that. But this question is, how large was the farm when you first bought it? My wife and I bought this farm back in 91 from a widow. And uh, it was 200 acres, and it was a dairy farm. The, the, the dad died maybe, I'm gonna guess, five to six months earlier than that. And then it was just time to do something with this. The cows were only gone there for about maybe six months until we started back in. So it always was a dairy farm as long as I know. Through the years, we have added acres. So in 98, we bought 40 acres. In 04, we bought another 33. In 15, we brought another 12. And then even before us, there was some acres added way back during the homesteaded years. I'm guessing back in the 20s and 30s and all, because you're dating way back to the 1880s, probably when it started. When they started parceling. So uh, yeah, this farm's made up of, you know, so now we're a total of 285 acres. Um, and as far as adding more, it's not easy. There's yeah, land more. price is only increased over time and, I and then continue then what's for sale and is it conveniently close for you to pay too much money for it yeah even that even 
you know, having the funds is one thing, but just getting an opportunity. To, yeah. To it has to make some kind of sense, I guess, uh, as far as us getting bigger and all that. I don't know. I personally, I think I'm big enough. Yeah. To touch into the acres, we had someone ask for specific acres when it came to crop rotation. What, how many acres are in corn? How many are in grass, pasture? How many are hay? So, like I said, the whole farm is 285 acres. Uh, hay acres that we actually harvest hay off of is about 100 to 110 acres. It'll vary from year to year. Usually oats as a nurse crop to a new seeding with alfalfa grass mix would be eight to 12 acres roughly, um, depending on the year. And then corn, anywhere between 45 and 50 acres. So not a lot of corn because we've got a hilly farm. Um, it all goes for feed. We don't sell anything. I don't know, maybe once or twice out of the years we had so much extra hay, maybe we ended up selling some low quality hay just to, you know, we'd have no great place to store it or something. But yeah, and then the balance is pasture. Um, almost everything is pasture that isn't. Uh, There's very little land that's that, wasted or That the or cows deemed, can't actually get to. Yeah, or deemed as even recreational. You had a small plot that was tax is recreation but even that now is we've yeah we did into... we did open that up some it was all box elders and just nothing for trees that were valued yep and now we uh, got some ponds down there and we're able to turn it, turn it or, into a small field or to graze it this i thought was an interesting question that uh i guess we've kind of just glazed over i guess we've never shown it but someone was interested what kind of pickup trucks we have i got a 2000 and Four Chevy red cab long box um, six oh gasser and then dad's got something kind of similar I'll let, him, I'll let him talk about it I've only owned two pickups in my life and uh, it was my dad's first new pickup a 1974 Chevy custom 20 a regular cab you know long box I guess and all that and then I basically inherited that from dad when I came here and it was rusting out but it was a good old tough 350 and all that and two uh drive. Right. A two wheel drive, yep. Oh by God, I put chains on that thing many, many times. Drove all the way to the feed mill and back in the winter. Those were the days. And then uh, in 2000, you were just a baby. And uh, we we had his sister already and uh, we knew we were gonna have more kids so we were looking for a crew cap. So I got a 2000 uh, uh, Chevy crew cap 3500. Long box, we put side racks on her so it kind of Im imitate my old one where we can haul cabs or we can take them off, put the gooseneck trailer on. I mean, I love the, and the reason you don't normally see it because I'm a firm believer that when the truck isn't getting used, it's in the garage, in, in by the house where it's less likely something uh, stupid happens to it. <laughs> like something backing into it or whatever. So. This guy was also asking, um, you know, how often are we hauling cattle and, and um, towing? And I think our, our truck lineup is a good representation of that. We're not hauling cattle very far or very often because yours is just a gasser. It's not a diesel and mine's not a diesel. And that's a big part of it. I don't think we put enough towing miles on to where oh, we no. justify a diesel pickup. No, and then the expense that would have went to get a diesel way back in the day, even now, I mean, it's crazy money. So, I mean, really, we don't buy cattle. I, the only thing we purchase here is a breeding bull. And about every other year, we replace our breeding bull. And that, that is going to need to happen this spring. Maybe we can throw a little video up on how we went about that. But um, Otherwise, everything is raised up here and uh, as far as just mostly heifer stuff. And, yeah, so the cattle trailers so, may be hooked up once or twice a month and yeah and maybe we sell some replacements uh occasionally that were there uh they're uh, going to another farm but uh, yeah nothing coming in everything's just going out and so it's not a crazy number speaking of cattle uh, a lot of people a lot of newcomers ask how many um, how many cows we're milking and how many cattle we have total here so the farm. barn the, the, the stall barn holds 40 and so we got about 40 to 45 milking cows. I do switch a few, and as long as my help is still kind of around, more than not. And then about 10 dry cows, which basically is cows that are dried up, that are, for you that don't know, that are pregnant. Um, they're usually dry for two to up to three months even at times. To dumb it down even more, it would be the, the cow that um, quits going to work every day and she's on vacation before she has her calf so she can grow, grow, that, calf. grow that calf and, and, um, and, and produce a healthy young yeah. calf. She needs to, Less she stress. Needs, yeah, she needs to be shut off in order for it to grow the calf inside her and then so that 
we can get a great punch of milk when it is finally time. Then we keep all the heifer calves and uh, bull calves are all sold at, at about a week old. That's where the side racks come on and with the truck again. We, we so do, we don't have to hook up a trailer, we can just... Yeah, we them. will only save maybe one or two steers a year, you know, maybe raise them up and maybe eat if I don't need them. We don't need them for meat, we'll sell them for a feeder calf or whatever at, at five to 600 pounds. So, uh, but all together, so with all the female stuff, a breeding bull, a couple steers, we're probably running around 120 head. Jump into another cattle related question is, are we milking registered cattle? And what's our opinion? So we're not milking any registered cattle. We don't have registered herd or any. I've bought registered cattle. bulls and not so much in the recent years. It seems like that was a really big deal back in the seventies and eighties. And I think it was something that the farmers looked for. And, and I don't know, some would say it's just a piece of paper with some numbers on it. But I think it, it, uh, they could get more money for those cattle. It was maybe more proven that this had good genetics. When the genetics world really started to take off and to go in the directions the farmers were looking for. Yeah, but as of right now, I don't think there's a huge gap between profitability and the high no. genetic cows. So I don't think that's as big as it was back in the no, day. Back in the day, it was a value. And then when you, you if you sold out, or I know the guys that put herds together and then sold them, maybe they, you know, start it again, but the registered cattle would bring bigger money for all sorts of different reasons that way. But anyway, yeah, we're, we're pretty much uh, not doing any of that. Yeah, but nothing against anybody that has. I know some people are huge into genetics. Well, it's, it's what you're into. Yeah, it's cool. Some people are huge in cattle. Some people are huge into their crops and equipment. <laughs> Equipments, yeah. Well, a lot of people have been leaving comments about if I purchased that round baler that I demoed and what my opinion was and if I'm still looking for one. So that round baler, I decided not to purchase that. It's too high end and too complicated of a baler and the brand kind of scares me. The salesman and some people would say, well, it's built by Heston, um, but I've heard stories where They'll say they can get parts, but they, it's not as readily available as a John Deere or a Case New Holland baler when it comes to serviceability and, and parts. So as for that brand and that specific baler, it had a lot of cool options, weren't necessarily as that I would put a huge value on. So that particular baler I wouldn't purchase. Well, you, you've done, so, you know, now you've had a little experience with that one and, and in the future you're going to become more confident. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out they all got their yeah, goods and bads, but I don't having a cutter. I don't know if that's necessarily important. We sale maybe it might have its place if we get the silage bales. Or, but I like the idea of something simpler, like uh, like the New Holland and the Case balers. They're cheaper, and they're cheaper for a reason. They're lighter. They have less. Um, I heard they wear out faster, but that's all opinion too. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd uh, I'm gonna shy away from an odd brand like that that Massey, there's not a whole lot of people to have them. I've, I've heard that if you want to spend the money, it's John Deere or Vermeer. And then this question's for dad. So when you first started farming, were you scared? Someone says that they, they're a younger farmer and they, you know, they kind of feel like they're really sticking their neck out and they moved off the, the family farm or, for, or started farming on their own or whatever the situation may be. And they expressed how they were scared and they want to hear your... Yes, I was scared. And I grew up with, I got six brothers and a sister. I'm the third from the youngest. You know, we've had a 50 cow dairy my dad and mom were on. And, and there was obviously plenty of work to do back then, but the income part wasn't. And so some of my brothers were still home yet. When I was out of high school, I worked with my dad for six and a half years before I came here. But I realized to get married and start my own family, it was gonna be a whole lot better all the way around for everyone to get along better and all that if I just got my own place. So my home, where I grew up was only maybe about four miles up the valley from here. So I do have family nearby. It was a little nicer getting started, but I was scared when I bought this. I mean, we looked at, my wife and I looked at like 30 farms. I was 24 years old and I didn't realize what I really did until after I did it. And then I really thought, wow, nobody really does this. Even back in 91, nobody, you know, usually it's a second farm off the home farm and then there's brothers together or, or son and dads. And, and, or they expand the original business. Yeah, they don't necessarily break away completely. We're, 
yes, we, we shared some machinery the first three to four years until we were able to get our, and I realized even now, it was just a lot better if we got our own stuff and, and it was, you, you didn't feel like you were uh, having to stick your neck out so much. And, it ain't easy and it's only been getting worse ever since. I mean, when I bought, we came out of the time when interest rates were extremely high. A lot of foreclosures. And that's what really got me scared. And I realized that they, so we bought it on a land contract, which that helped a lot because a young man, I didn't have any credit of that any kind. And I didn't know myself what we were capable of. But it took us maybe about three to five years and we realized we were going to be okay here. We were going to make it. And then we were able to start purchasing uh, better machines and uh, of course it didn't take too long we were able to buy land and and, uh, and keep adding to the farm and making it better so next question what tractor slash item would we buy next i think that's a question for you yeah that's, that'd be for us uh, younger guys and i think if we were to buy another tractor it would be a step up in horsepower and frame just because that's the way it's going because we already have all the other yeah, we got plenty frames. Of, so we got plenty of the mid-sized and they're in good shape semi the, the set like a your john deere lineup five six seven eight nine series and we got a lot of sevens which is kind of your mid to large range tractors. 100 to 150 horse range yeah so i think if we were to purchase another tractor and it was going to be for here it would it'd probably have to be an eight series otherwise our or or unless we decided to replace a tractor, but we don't have any tractors. And that anymore. would only be if something drastic happened. Yeah, like an accident or a fire. Or yeah. The, uh, to replace a 7 Series or jump up to something bigger. And then item, uh, we've talked about how it'd be nice like having a gooseneck trailer to move items around. Like a flatbed. Yeah, so yeah. if you guys got an opinion on that, leave that down in the comments, what yeah. you think would be a good... Uh, because for me, I mean, I've been there, you know, back when I was your age, I had to list 50 things long and now it's more, I'm trying to get outside the box, maybe get into some other avenues, like just, just something completely non-farm just to, because maybe eventually one of you boys will be running things. Someone asked about, I think on Instagram, what uh, our YouTube experience has been like and, you know, has it been positive? And, uh, what incentivizes us to keep doing it and motivates us to keep doing it and is you know is it worth all the effort and then also they they asked what has our local community thought of our YouTube channel and uh, to answer that when it comes to our local community it was really cool seeing how because we never really we'd mention it if uh, if somebody was asking questions about our farm, like, hey, go check out our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about yeah. us. But we were never like broadcasting it to everybody and anybody. So it was cool to see how organically they came across our... They stumbled across yeah, us and they're like... Our word of mouth or yeah. they saw a certain video and it's really cool to see like, hey, I, I seen you guys were on YouTube and then the first thing I normally ask them, what, the, what was the first video you watched? And that's been super enjoyable for me to see what what caught their attention and what got them to our channel. I mean, I, I love it more because I've always was big into agriculture, promoting and teaching. And I realized that being that we're exposed to so much stuff and I never really set out to do this, but I realized it's such a value to the rest of the world. You know, we all know the old timers that are really good at stuff. But some of them are better at teaching it. Some don't even want to talk about it. And that's going to die with them. And then the other thing is dairy promotion. We've had two dairy breakfasts here. We've, we've hosted church on a farm here probably, I don't know, four to five different times. Um, I had quite a few different class trips that came out here to agriculture class and the 4K. And that was all before the COVID times. And now with liabilities and things, we're very cautious. But... I always loved doing that. And then when you started this channel, I didn't know nothing about how all this is going to work. I didn't know what YouTube even was. I mean, I'm probably the least electronic guy around here. And uh, I think it's just a beautiful way for us to show how things work and to promote and, you know, to show the good and the bad and the reality of what agriculture is, especially dairy. Yeah. We deal with every day. YouTube has been a great way for us to continue advocating for egg as times have changed because you know the their dairy breakfast and everything are still great but it's just now it's a new form of 
advocating for ag. So now in a classroom, I've called our local school, and, and the, whether it's the ag teacher, the third grade teacher, whatever, we've had some videos that I said, check out this video. I think it would, it would do great in, in your classroom to, to get those little minds um, to see what, what is without having them to get busing and all these things to get those children actually out here. So that it, these little cameras are just amazing to me. I think back when I started here, we'd had to have a whole truckload of equipment to yeah, get this that, type whole, of whole quality. Group of, whole group of people. Yeah. You know, set everything. It's been positive, our experience on YouTube, and we're super grateful for all you guys because you help motivate us to keep doing it. I think personally, I would, even if I got zero views, I would still make a video every now and then because I've been making small videos since... I think 2017, that's just how I like to, you know, express myself creatively, I guess you could say. Well, that was the thing. I was impressed with how you uh, edit them. Yeah. There's always those things where really nothing's happening, where you might end up dropping or fumbling the camera. <laughs> you guys don't need, need to be uh, used. We don't need to use your time up on all that senseless stuff. We just cut right to the chase and get to what really is going to make a difference. And then the other thing is, is how my wife and I too, when we came here, the first, especially the first 10 years, we take pictures of all the improvements of the buildings and different things that we changed and added. And uh, now here's a way you can, you know, you get, as far as the grandchildren, or could you imagine back in the day, you get back in the twenties when they were thrashing just and building those off. barns. If you had this quality, this would be just priceless stuff. As for YouTube, super happy with how it's gone. Super happy. happy that all of you care enough to watch what we're doing day to day. <laughs> and I'm actually surprised they are as interested as they are. I think our, our, our viewers are mostly, well, the comments are coming from a lot from the older generation, guys older than me, guys that grew up on it, and, and they talk about the memories it brings back, maybe the style of farming we're doing. And we love, we love hearing those comments and reading them, and, and we love And then it was the just, uh, just a, a few days back where a young fellow came up to me at a sporting event and said, you know, I had this hat on, and he, so he knew I was who I was, and uh, I was impressed on how he was so curious and so interested in it. So even a few young viewers that we can inspire and say this is... Uh, it's great to see the community that we've brought together within yeah. something so simple as a, a YouTube channel. It's so all, as a farmer, I always felt like um, we're not going to be famous. I don't know if I want to be extremely famous, but it is nice to be known for something, something good, something that, that's a value in the world. Yeah, leave our, leave our mark. A lot of people ask questions about using the silage pile versus silos, and if you had your pick, what would you use? Um, do you prefer the silo over the piles and pros and cons, things like that? Just to sum it up, your opinion. So what's your opinion first? Well, obviously, if we had all the room in the world, I think you'd have a bunch of, and all the money in the world, you'd have a bunch of bunkers, you'd have them all lined up, yeah. you wouldn't be opening piles or- First, second, them. third crop yeah. corn silage, yeah, and you'd, you'd have that really neat, maybe all under a roof, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it'd be almost <laughs> like a huge commodity shed for silage. But obviously that isn't economical. Um, the silo is nice because you can store a lot in a small area. You know, it's all vertical, you're not taking up a lot of space. I think that's the benefit of a silo or a, a grain bin style setup versus a big pile. Yeah. And I mean, that's just the thing. So this time of the year, that, that, that silage pile, the only negative part of it is when it's really cold. And uh, that's not even as so bad, but the snow and ice pack that gets on top of it. And I'm one that I have to sort that off. I won't bring that into my cattle. <laughs> so in a silo, it's, it's, it's frozen up there too. So the silo, Beautiful for summer feeding, warmer months, and the piles, beautiful for the winter months where we use a lot more of it. And that way we'll just be able to go in with our huge loader. And then if the bobcat goes down, we got the loader tractor, you got options, silos, you got unloaders and machinery. They both have their place. I think if we had some silos here that were in very good shape, maybe I wouldn't have any trenches if they already all were here, that we were able, okay, we're gonna use them. They're here already. And, set up for it or maybe i would have got sick of those over time maybe i would have went you know that's uh so they got their place for more farming stuff would we ever add on to the barn and i think for our yard we're kind of limited for space if we want to do that i think i would hate it 
I think um, the, the one thing I believe farming is, and maybe this goes for other industries too, it, it, it's an addiction to get bigger, to get more. And then we find ourselves saying, well, if I, let's say we go a big freestyle barn, parlor, oh, it'll be easier milking cows, but then we got more of them. And then pretty soon we're hired help. And then you've got other things that you, you know, you're maybe not as hands-on as the cows as much. You're working on the equipment side of things more. My philosophy always was more, and even my wife was pretty much on this page too, let's just get to a certain level, which the barn could hold 40, so we're going to max out at 40 to 45, and then uh, get better. You know, things like that. Focus on quality. Quality. And that jumps into another question. As someone outside of agriculture, what would, what would someone in agriculture tell a consumer to so that they could advocate for small farms and promote small farms. What do you think they should do to support us and advocate for us? Well, I just think uh, our viewers alone are kind of saying they just love the, you know, that, that small farm, you know, personalized um, way of operating here where we're not dealing with so many different people and the things like that. I don't really want to go negative against uh, the bigger mega farms, but I think you ask any consumer, and, and overall, I think they would, they'd prefer to see more smaller farms. Even all our businesses back in the day were so much more plentiful locally when there was smaller farms and businesses like that around. So I'd bring up uh, quality on a small farm. Um, it's, it's definitely more controlled, but like my dad was saying, we don't want to bash the big farms because I think to feed the population that we have and for the limited amount of people working in agriculture we need to be more we, we were kind of forced to be more commercial to keep up with the, the demand and um, to feed the world at the rate we're, we're doing so I don't it'd be very hard there be there would need to be a lot more people in the work doing in, it. in agriculture yeah so that that's just a thing there's there's uh, you know it would be better if more people were in it but the one thing I felt on this smaller farm, so we're producing about uh, maybe a little over a ton of milk a day, you know, along with our, our beef with the, you know, the cull cows and, and, and raisin heifers. There's, there's some stuff there, but we don't make the company that, you know, whether we're buying fertilizer or seed or selling our cattle to, we don't make them a lot of money or our milk. You know, so they love us, we got great quality. We usually don't have big issues when it comes to all that. Um, you're only dealing with one person that pretty much takes care of the cows and the paperwork and everything. It's more about the economics that's leaning things more towards larger and larger. And, and uh, what really bothers me is going back. If we, if the, if the world wants us to go back to where it was, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to back up to get back into, you know, split everything back up and start start going back in that direction again, you know. So to simplify it, I think just tell your friends and, and everybody that, you know, if you want quality food, uh, you know, get to know your, your local farms, get to know your, your local producers so that you know exactly where your, your food is coming from. But if you want cheap food, um, readily available, uh, we need the commercial farms for that, so. Yeah, there, there's good and bad, um, but if you want to advocate for small farms, that's how I would do it. Is uh, what would you have done differently in the past to improve the farm? You know where it is today. What do you well, think? Well, yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. They always say, and you know, like when we came here for what we paid per acre, and even then it seemed like crazy money. Um, we we probably would have tried to purchase more land. You know, back when there was more land available and it wasn't so out of reach. Um, but then too, we were still scared. We didn't want to go into debt that we did, we, you know, so a little of that. Um, there's always a lot of little things in between there, but I really got to say, when I look back at from the time my wife and I started out and how we evolved and how we built this place to what it is, there ain't a lot of, big things I would change. You know, maybe maybe owning more land maybe would have interfered with some other things that we did that we thought. We you never know how it would have played. No, I think it, you, you almost can kind of beat yourself up trying to do that. So I, I believe for knowing what we knew 
knowing what history already done up to that point, I believe we made we made the right decisions for the time. Um, and, and and that was another thing I should touch on. My wife's been a, a very huge supporter of. Um, I'll come in the house, I'll say, what do you think about purchasing uh, this piece of equipment or something? And then we all call and I'll get paperwork. And, and she's always been pretty good about it. if it's going to save us some time or save us some headache of trying to rent one or, or borrow us one. She's always very good about supporting me with that. So we're thinking a lot alike, you know, financially and business-wise. Definitely makes it easier having a a partner that's on board when it comes to being in agriculture or any type of business. That's 100% for sure. And then uh, speaking on the, the, the getting into farming topic, we get a lot of young young people commenting, asking um, what we would recommend when it comes to them trying to get into egg, how to go about it. You know, especially if they're not in a situation where they would be able to take over or an area. Or they farm. don't, they, they have grown up or with it. Yeah, outside of the agriculture realm, how would we advise them to go about ta tackling that? My advice would be start working for a dairy or a cattle operation or a cropping operation because the world is starving for someone that wants to learn, someone who wants to work hard. And, and you have, I believe, if like if I didn't have my kids, because they're going to be first in line, of course, um, as long as their heart is in it. But if your heart is really in it and you really love it and and you want it really, really bad, I believe that you'd have a pretty good shot of whoever owns all that. They're going to come of age eventually. Things happen where you may have opportunity sooner that way than just going out and buying some place like we did. You know, I broke away from the home place. I knew how to farm. It's just uh, financially, we didn't have a clue how that was going to go. That's a good point. If you're from outside of agriculture and you're looking to get into agriculture, just just working for someone. They will in, take in, you. In the industry is huge. Uh, there's plenty of jobs. And out you there. can learn. You can learn hands on. That's the way we all did. You know, we. We, we learn from our parents, but I mean, that's the thing and ask questions. And then of course with these, these videos to your, your phones today, you can just about, yeah, information a, is everywhere. There's a crazy amount of information out so there. So then, and that's, that to me would be your best bet far as, I don't want to say get given a farm or necessarily inheriting it, but you would have a very good shot of becoming the main man, so to speak. I've I've known one place where there was a bachelor, and uh, the main man never really had anything but a paycheck, and he he's holding the title to almost all of it, yep. you know, after after his boss passed. And then even going about it the other way and trying to buy your own stuff, we don't want to deter people from that because there's people that have done it, like Dad, and there's even people now that have done it. You know, just starting small and building over time is, is super important. I wouldn't advise anyone to go out and overspend hoping for a return. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd dip your toes in the water first before yeah. you go. The thing of it is, is, is everything we sell to make money here, th that market is so unstable. So you look, and it's kind of started back in the early 90s where, especially milk, I remember my dad coming home and bragging about how uh, the milk check was uh, went up a dollar from one to the last one. And now it'll sway five dollars between every check. And the same with the cattle and crops and whatever you're making your money off of in agriculture. So it is all over the place. So you're right. You take it slow and, and not, you know, make good sound decisions. And I think if your conscience is really chewing on you and you're scared, you'll be you probably turn out okay. Yeah, I think if you, being nervous is a good thing because that means you care. You're that aware you're, and you're digging more and you're doing, and I, I, I guess I would say, I've done a lot of research. If you dig in those drawers with all the machines I bought, I got so many different brochures from all the brands and, and uh, quotes on stuff. And then, you know, eventually you just bite the bullet and purchase or just say, no, we're not doing that. But anyways, another good thing that you brought up when it came to markets, I think for someone starting out, getting into a niche market would probably be the way to go. Yeah. Try to find something different. Um, staying competitive in the commodity markets if you're not already established is definitely 
it's a, it's a strong and maybe selling directly to the consumer you know, yeah. going down those avenues where you have more control yeah things like grass fed free range uh, you know yeah. locally grown you know try, well, try would, some of those avenues they would purchase your animal right off the farm and then take it to their slaughter and have it done up you know that things like that you, you know maybe you would have to work somewhere else for a while yeah, yeah, seeking out size. seeking out those niche markets or a supplemental income to help get you. And you might be a lot happier doing it like that. So maybe you don't have quite your whole life all in one basket of things to one thing. Yep. So that that'd be our advice for uh, anyone trying to start farming or get into it. Switching topics here, we've uh, gotten a couple comments about what type of cameras we're using and equipment we're using for YouTube. So I could talk a lot about this. I could talk all day about this, but uh, simplify it. I'm using two GoPros is what we have currently. And I think I'm gonna stick with that brand. They're really hardy. Um, I found out that they hold up to stuff. Uh, I've had cameras run over two different times, <laughs> uh, dropped plenty of times, and they're out in the elements. Uh, they overheat or get cold, and I don't think a, a nice... I think that's the thing I'm so amazed of. You can fit it in the palm of your hand, and it's you could probably toss it like a baseball and go pick it up. And, and it'd probably be just fine. It's fine. Yeah, so I'm, I'm super happy with GoPro. Specific GoPros I got is a 9, a Hero 9, and then a, uh, an 11 as well. Those are the two cameras I got. Super happy with the 9. And um, there's some minor upgrades with the 11, but uh, I think I could have got away with two 9s. I'm pleased with that. So for those of you that are interested, that's uh, what we use for cameras. So we're going to end off the video here. It's getting kind of long. We're going to probably split the video up into at least two parts. So stay on the lookout for part number two. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking around to the end. I'll uh, throw links up above where to find that other video or down in the description as well. Um, leave plenty of comments down below so we can answer your questions in future videos. Leave your opinions as well. We enjoy reading them. Tell us your story. We, uh, we love reading the comments. And uh, also make sure to like and subscribe. Subscribe. <laughs> that helps us out a lot. Helps uh, tell your friends, share the video, but uh, stay on the lookout for uh, the, next, the next part of this video.